If you could have a drink with anyone in the theater world, who would it be? I'm Anthony Caffarelli, and I'm running through my list. Each week, I'll sit down with cast members, bartenders, and personalities from New York's theater district and get a behind-the-scenes look at what it's like to live, work, and play on Broadway. Come have a drink with us on Broadway Bartender. Welcome to Broadway Bartender. My name is Anthony Caparelli. We are here at New World Stages in the heart of the theater district in Times Square, home of my show, The Imbible, A Spirited History of Drinking. And this week we are making drinks using cranberry juice. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a drink that I actually created. Um, and this is, I'm, I chose this drink in honor of my special guest, um, but it is a cranberry drink that uses bourbon, and it's actually based on a pretty familiar recipe uh, to folks who've been drinking bourbon for a while. It's bourbon and amaretto, and then I uh, sweeten it up and lighten it up with a little bit of cranberry juice. So the first thing I'm gonna do, as usual, is fill up my mixing tin with ice, and I'm gonna start with two ounces of bourbon per drink, and so I'm making two, so that would be four ounces of bourbon. And I want about a half ounce of amaretto per drink, so I'm gonna go ahead and put uh, one full ounce in my tin, and I hate these pour spouts, there we go. And then just about another half ounce of cranberry juice, so I'm doing one ounce. And then I want a little bit of acidity to cut this, so some fresh lime juice goes right in there. And for those of you paying attention who are familiar with cocktails, you might start to see some similarities between this and another really popular drink that I'm gonna be making at the end of the episode. So I'm gonna go ahead and shake this up really well. And when we shake as bartenders, we're mixing the ingredients, but more importantly, we're chilling and diluting the ingredients. So we're gonna go ahead and shake this. And what we're looking for is frost to form on the tin. And then I know the, gin, that the, the drink is at the right temperature. So that's just about perfect. And we'll go ahead and strain this into two martini glasses. And I wanna garnish this with some fresh orange peel, which I have right here. And I call this the Samuels. I actually created this drink uh, for Maker's Mark in honor of uh, the president at the time, Bill Samuels Jr. And the reason that I chose this drink is because, or the reason I chose cranberry, uh, is again for the color, because our special guest this week is Rod. Hello. From Avenue Q. Wow. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm great. How are you? I'm well. So the reason I chose cranberry juice, mm -hmm. um, I understand that you're a Republican. <laughs> and yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So we welcome all uh, political stripes here at Broadway Bartender. Well, uh, so I wanted you. to make you something with a red ingredient oh, in it. So thoughtful. Thank and I would you. like to point out I am a Republican, but I am not an idiot. Wow, okay, that's fair, and, and I will try and, yes, respect that. Yeah, um, thank you. So I imagine you, election night was, uh, was, was a pretty good night for you, having a good time? Well, yeah, a little turbulent. Really? And, uh, as, a, as a gay Republican, you know, I was, uh, I was a bit conflicted. Well, I'm sorry, mm. what, what was that? A, a gay Republican. A, okay, so intelligent and also gay and a Republican. Right, okay. That's yeah, there's a lot going on here. Right, no, I understand that, absolutely. Okay, um, so tell me, does that come into your role in Avenue Q? Uh, well, a little bit, you know, uh, during the show, I kind of um, come into myself, if you will. I, uh, you know, come out with uh, a secret. Mm -hmm. And that secret is, can you tell us, or do we have to go see the show? Well, uh, no, it's, it's out. I'm, that's I'm it. gay. Anthony, Got it. That's right. what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple drinks. Yeah, yes. So, actually, mm. I'm a huge fan of Avenue Q. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, I, I've been a fan of you since you've been on Broadway. Mm. Um, I understand that you guys recently celebrated uh, a milestone for the show. Yes, very exciting. We celebrated 13 years in New York City. Really? Is, yes, very exciting. What did you do to celebrate that? Uh, well, uh, at 13, you know, uh, one becomes a man. So we had a bar mitzvah. Funny you should mention that. Mm -hmm. I think I attended that. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, we had uh, uh, these yarmulkes made for the entire audience, 
and we had kosher juice boxes after the show. Really? It was a very nice reception. Mm -hmm. And that was right here at New World Stages. Again, you're playing uh, in the same theater that That's right, Bottle in this is. beautiful space. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So tell me about what the show has, uh, what it's been like being with the show for that long. I mean, 13 years, that's a huge run, right? Well, yes, it's, it's kind of incredible that uh, the little dirty puppet show from Off-Broadway should last, uh, you know, 13 years. But How did it start? Uh, well, it started at the Vineyard Theater, actually, off-Broadway, and then it was such a big hit that they transferred to Broadway, where uh, it won the Triple Crown for uh, at the Tony Awards, beating a little show called um, Wicked. Really? Yes, and you it won beat Best... beat Wicked. Be beat Wicked for Best Musical, Best Book, Best Score. Yes, it was a huge upset uh, for everyone else. So one of the things that I love about the show is I think you were one of the first shows to have a tremendously successful Broadway run, mm -hmm. take a little break, and then right. come back for an arguably even more successful run off-Broadway. Yeah, Broadway. We've, we've passed the number of performances that were done uh, on Broadway, off-Broadway. We just celebrated 3,000 performances here at New World Stages. That is unbelievable. Yes. So now your show was very topical. Mm. And I know, um, you know, when I first saw the show, very soon after it came out, it was extremely relevant. And I think it, you know, it, it set the dialogue for a generation. You were talking, one of the first people to openly talk about the fact that um, the internet is for porn, right. for example, yes. which I don't think is um, that groundbreaking an idea anymore. <laughs> um, but how have you kept the show, you know, how have you kept the show relevant? Do you find that the audience is still relate to the show? Is it still topical? Sure. Well, uh, it's funny you should ask because uh, we sort of feel like now the show is even more relevant than ever before. You know, we talk about racism, we talk about um, uh, the, the internet being for porn, right, and sure. uh, there's a lyric about, um, originally it was George Bush is only for now, but uh, we've of course kept current and Donald Trump is only for now. Mm -hmm. From your lips to Yahweh's ears, my yes, friend. Indeed. So yeah. let me ask you now: If um, is it a little bit concerning? Do you think that topics that were I thought settled issues 13 yeah. years ago, mm -hmm. when we're kind of looked at as like, yeah, we're over that, we've learned those lessons, are now more relevant than ever, and are, are back again as you know hot topics of, of conversation? Sure. Well, it's uh, it's not not the best news, I guess, but uh, luckily as uh, as artists telling a story, we can do our part to sort of educate the world about uh, these things. Yeah. Now, you were also one of the first shows that, um, that featured puppets. Mm. Um, now, I'm sure that was a wonderful opportunity for yourself, because I don't think there was a lot of work. You probably weren't working very much. Well, it's true. It's, it's nice to have some visibility for us fabricated Americans. Oh, is that mm -hmm. the, the politically correct term? Well, that's what I like to say, you know. It's, uh, yeah, it's the more PC term. Okay, mm -hmm. good. But well, we want to make sure that we're, we're staying but PC. But we're friends, so yeah. you can call me a puppet if you Okay, want. great. I'll, I'll try and remember fabricated yeah. American, yeah, though. Yeah, Okay, okay. so uh, how, you know, being one of the first fabricated Americans on Broadway, mm -hmm. I, I know that first since... First gay Republican fabricated Americans. Wow, you're just breaking mm -hmm. all kinds of molds. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Rod. Mm -hmm. So I know since then, though, the, that's opened the doors for many other shows that have incorporated... I mean, heck, I did a show a little while ago that had a hand puppet in it for five minutes, and oh, it was really? completely an homage to Avenue Q. Yeah, wow, that's very sweet. Well, you know, what's interesting is puppetry has really been something that's uh, been intended for adults for centuries. Right. But uh, Avenue Q and uh, other shows on Broadway, uh, something like Hand to God, right, have, I saw. Uh, have helped bring puppets back to the front for um, adult audiences, which is very exciting. Do you think you have an advantage being a fabricated American, um, that you're able to say things that maybe um, organic Americans wouldn't be able to say? <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that's a lot of why Avenue Q is so successful, because we can uh, say the things that maybe you're thinking but are a little too scared to say. And so you can deal with subjects that might otherwise not be appropriate or, or easily digested um, by a general audience. Sure, much like uh, you know uh, other shows with puppets for children on television that may or may not bear a resemblance to our show uh, do. You know, it's uh, 
puppets are a great tool to, to say something. Right. Mm. And I think that's obviously extremely important in the arts. Um, you know, there was just an incident uh, at Hamilton mm. dealing with, um, you know, the ability of artists to speak freely on stage and sure. whether it is a safe space. And, you know, these are really, really important questions. And I think you guys have absolutely been, been trailblazers yeah. in that. Well, that's um, a testament to our brilliant writers. I yeah. have to say, the show is absolutely brilliantly written. And if any of our viewers haven't seen Avenue Q, um, and America being a huge country and the world being huge, I'm sure that's still a good number of people. Please, if you come to New York, it's, it's on the must-see list. The, the yeah. show um, is, is, as I said, just broke so much ground um, and paved the way for uh, so many other shows and dialogue and discussions. Um, so I want to know a little bit about um, the heritage of your, you as a fabricated American. <laughs> um, I've, I've obviously, Avenue Q didn't just pop up um, on its own in a vacuum. Um, yeah. From what I understand, there's a lineage behind uh, some of the, the uh, characters, or, or at least the puppets, in Avenue Q. Well, sure. Like I sort of mentioned before, we, uh, we have some sort of resemblance to uh, characters you might recognize from your own childhood. Right. And uh, that, you know, still are appearing on TV today. But, um, you know, my, my father, I guess, Rick Lyon, who uh, designed all the puppets in the show, um, did a really great job creating a, a look that was unique to Avenue Q, but still sort of homaging characters that you might recognize. And, you know, that was really important to me the first time I saw Avenue Q because there was an air of familiarity to mm -hmm. it. Um, and I think I was very receptive to um, listening to folks talk about difficult issues sure. um, and you know using it as a way to gain information because that you know quite frankly that's what I grew up on yeah um, well, it, it tugs at your heartstrings a little bit doesn't it? very much yeah. there was an element of nostalgia to the mm -hmm. show um, even though it was clearly repackaged in a very smart very adult way sure. uh, which I think is some you know really one of the most magical things about the show yeah. um, so I would like to now uh, make a drink that I believe we serve here at New World Stages. Okay. Um, that is named after you. Oh, I think I know the one you're talking about. M what, which one is that to make is sure? Is it the Rod Mopolitan? It is the Rod Mopolitan. Yes, yes. And by the way, congratulations, because I know um, it takes a certain level of success to have a drink named after you in well, the theater you. district. Mm. Um, and so. Kudos on that. Yeah, thank you. So I want to go ahead and uh, and make that. I'm sure you're okay. familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, but this again, most people are very familiar with the ingredients. And I'm going to go ahead and serve it in a cocktail glass, just as I did, or the martini glass, Lovely. as most people know it as. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start with ice in my tin. Okay. But this time, I'm going to use vodka. Oh. And I like to actually. I don't know if this is um, an according to Hoyle Rodmapolitan, but I'm going to use citrus vodka. Because I oh, think that makes a really nice addition. A little, with a little zest. A little zest, mm. as it were, right. Yes. And then I'm going to do a little bit of triple sec, which is orange liqueur. And I've okay. done about two ounces of vodka and about a half ounce of triple sec. And then, okay. of course, I need my cranberry juice. Mm. And again. Republican red. Republican red. Mm -hmm. About a half ounce of cranberry juice. Excellent. And just like in the Samuels, some lime. Mm. And that sour cuts the sweetness of the cranberry. Lovely. And I'm going to go ahead and shake this up really well. Same as we did with the Samuels. Again, chilling and diluting the drink. Now, you can actually get this drink when you come see the show, right? That's right, yes. We have a fully stacked bar. And I would encourage you to, uh, you know, have a cocktail or two while you watch the show. Now, are you the only character that has a drink named after you? No, know, I think there are uh, drinks named after almost all the main characters in the show. Which is uh, nice. I think my, my personal favorite, other than the Radmapolitan, would be the uh, Dark and Horny. I'm sorry? Uh, dark and Horny. Dark and Horny. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for I, our friend Trekkie Monster, our porn-loving neighbor, Trekkie Monster. I think I need mm -hmm. to try some of these drinks. Yes, come by any time you want. And then I'm going to go ahead and garnish it with an orange peel, as <laughs> I did before. And you can see the similarities between these two drinks. Lovely. And that is our imbibal twist mm. on a Rod Mopolitan. I'm going to get you a straw. Thank you. So you can try that. Mm. See what you think? Very good. I think it is. Yes. I feel like Carrie Bradshaw. Excellent. Mm. Yes. 
classic. Mm. So, Rod, I understand that you brought um, a friend along, yes. also from the show, mm -hmm. um, Ben De Roche. That's right. Um, can you go get him? I'd love to keep talking sure, to him for a little yeah, bit. Sure. Yeah. Let me go see if I can find him. Great. Thank you. Ben, how are you, my friend? I'm great, I'm great. Thank you for being on Broadway Bartender. Hey, Folks, this is Ben DeRoche. He is a puppeteer in Avenue Q. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, my friend, that's a good gig. Thank you, yeah, it's a great time. It's a fantastic show. So, um, first of all, how did you get into puppeteering? Well, it was a sort of a hobby I had as a kid. I was about seven or eight and was really obsessed with Jim Henson and the Muppets and Sesame Street and uh, Long story short, I met a puppeteer in my town, in my hometown, uh, Ottawa, Ontario, in Canada. And uh, from there, it just sort of snowballed from a hobby into a career. Wow, and so how long have you been puppeteering? I mean, I guess t going on 20 years, um, you know, from, from you know, it being a hobby through to now being my full-time gig. Dude, that's amazing, because, you know, I would think that full-time puppeteering gigs are kind of thin on the ground. Sure, yeah, we're a rare breed of yeah. full-time puppeteer. Um, but, you know, it's it's something I love so much, so I count myself very lucky that I get to do it. That's, I don't know that I knew, and now you and I have actually worked together before. Right. Yes. It was maybe five years ago or something like yeah, that yeah. On, a, on a play development thing, that project we were working on. Right. I don't know that I knew you were a puppeteer, man. Yes, man of many talents. That's amazing. <laughs> so how did you end up getting the, uh, the Avenue Q gig? Uh, actually, I worked with uh, a guy named John Tartaglia, who was the original Princeton and Rod uh, on Broadway, and uh, he, he had a blacklight puppet show that toured around the country called Imagine Ocean. I did that for a couple years, and then one thing kind of led to another, and um, I was asked to come and join the company here at New World Stages. Wow. Dude, congratulations. You can try that. I don't think oh, Rod touched it. Oh, yeah. I don't think I'll need it. this straw. So, <laughs> cheers. That's amazing. Cheers. Thank you. So, you said something that intrigues me. You said you play, uh, or, or you, w w what's the right word? Puppet, animate? Uh, puppeteer. Puppeteer. Yes. Two characters. That's right, yeah. I play um, Rod, who yeah. you met, and um, Princeton, who's kind of the fresh out of college, uh, ingenue uh, character who's uh, looking for his purpose through the show. That's kind of his, his storyline is about finding his purpose in life. Now, th and there's no small characters in Avenue Q. I mean, it's very much yeah, an ensemble piece. it's a, it's a piece. very small cast, yeah. yeah. And what's fun about the puppetry element is that it allows uh, one actor to play multiple characters. So uh, the actress who plays Kate Monster, who's kind of the uh, female love interest to Princeton, also plays Kate's nemesis, Lucy the Slut. Right. And, uh, and then there's an actor who plays Trekkie Monster, as well as uh, Nikki, Rod's roommate, and the uh, Bad Idea Bear. Uh, who I, I feel like you'd get along with. I, they're, I, they're always think, uh, encouraging yes. lots of drinking. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think I might have gone to college with him or his brother. <laughs> um, so when, just to be clear for our viewers now, when you say you play two characters, it doesn't mean that you're playing one then understudying one. You're right, playing two right. in the same performance. Within the same performance, yeah, I play, I play both characters. And um, sometimes there's some logistics that happen with the help of other puppeteers to allow those characters to be on stage at the same time. Uh, but the performer uh, who, who's playing Princeton and Rod is always doing the voice for both characters. And you guys are fully visible during the show, right? The puppeteers are fully visible. Yeah, that's right. And I think that came from a um, early on in the development of Avenue Q, they were pitching the show as a TV series, as a, as a concept for a, a TV show. And uh, in these pitch meetings, they didn't have, of course, like all the fancy um, the scenic elements that you would hide the puppeteers behind. And the, um, the producers were responding to the puppeteer being visible with the puppet. It was something they really found interesting and different. So when the show was then developed for the stage, um, the concept of having the puppeteers visible was carried through. And I think it's something that makes the show really unique uh, and is also a really great way for the audience to um, see a more full per uh, performance from the puppeteer because you're, you're able to get information from me, Ben, the human on stage, but also from the puppet that I'm carrying around. Wow, well put, my friend. Oh, thank you. And it's become a, like, a, like a, a style of puppetry now. I remember we like um, Rod and I were talking about Hand of God. That's mm. the same technique that they use sure. there. And I remember actually that you, now that you say that, reading both characters, reading the puppeteer and the puppet, and uh -huh. it, it made a much richer experience. Yeah, a lot of times people will see the show and um, say to me, wow, it's amazing you were able to do everything with your body the same as the puppet. 
But what sort of I, I like to giggle about secretly is that the, the puppet doesn't really do much more than open and close its mouth. You know, so I think the audience really projects a lot of the emotion that you read from the human's face onto the puppet character, which really helps tell the story in a, in a more full, full-fledged way. So you have to be completely aware of your entire body, unlike um, some of the, like the Henson presentations, those kinds of things. Yeah. You, you're fully aware of like what your toe is doing when you're on stage. Right? Yeah, in a lot of ways, there's also a lot of muscle memory that plays into it because you, as the puppeteer, you're not really watching the puppet while you're performing. Whereas, you know, if I were working on Sesame Street or on camera, I would, I would use a monitor to help me see what, what the puppet is doing. Uh, but on stage in Avenue Q, we, we don't have that luxury. So you really practice a lot in the mirror to make sure you know what your arm is doing in relation to your own body without looking at it. It's all, you know, in, in your muscles. Wow, that's, <laughs> that fascinates. I can't imagine what it's like, especially learning two roles um, where you not only have to learn lines mm. and make the voices different, but you have completely different um, puppet, I guess, uh, mannerisms, mm. right? I mean, they have sure. different personalities that and you have I, to... I came in with a bit of an advantage. I was a huge fan of Avenue Q since I was like a teenager. My, my parents brought me to New York to see um, Avenue Q when I was 14. And I remember sitting in the audience and being like, those people have the best job in the whole world. So from there, I, I was just like obsessed with all aspects of the show. And coming into it and through the rehearsal process, I think that helped me a lot, just having an understanding of how the show worked and who these characters were. Dude, just tremendous work. I just can't tell you how much, how impressed I am, not only with the show, but with the work that goes into um, putting it on, because as someone who is on stage myself, I can't imagine adding that second layer. It's just, it's unbelievable to me. Um, and it's so effective. And as I was talking to, you know, with, to Rod about, I think it, it does allow you to, to discuss some really difficult things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to talk about quite as candidly. Sure, completely. Uh, I remember when I saw the show when I was 14, you know, 13 years ago, um, the moment when Rod comes out at the end, hearing an entire audience of people applaud for this puppet on stage for coming out was just like so moving and so beautiful. And I, I still feel that when we do the show now, it's, uh, it's amazing how a, how a puppet can really convey profound emotions. Was that the first time you got to experience that at that level um, of sort of size of audience and emotional response um, mm -hmm. as a puppeteer? Sure, yeah, I think so. Especially being on stage with a puppet. I've done other shows where the, the puppeteers aren't visible, but I, I guess being on stage with the puppet has like, you, you're more closely connected to the audience and you can actually see them responding. Dude, congratulations again, man. It's, it's a hell of a gig, uh, especially for someone who is a professional puppeteer. <laughs> Cheers, folks, Cheers. if you Thanks haven't so seen Avenue Q, New World Stages um, right here in this theater. Next time you're in New York City, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Thank you so much for tuning in. Drink well, drink responsibly. Check us out next week at broadwaybartender.com. Cheers. And there we have a Rod Napolitan with a little imbibal twist on it. Have you got a strap? Oh, sure. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>